welcome to the 2022's first uh, BrainX community live event. And we're very excited that we are starting with a special theme uh, this year. So to begin with, uh, many of you who are joining us for the first time, the BrainX community was formed uh, more than three years ago with the idea that we wanted to create a platform where we foster research development in machine learning or AI uh, with its application in healthcare for good. And you can see the picture over there, this is from three plus years ago. PF has started uh, having physical meetings. Over time, this has grown to be a 4,000 plus member strong international community with a 2,000 plus member strong uh, LinkedIn group and growing. Uh, we of course have our website. I'll showcase some of the, the key aspects of that. And we hold these monthly sessions over here to foster education and collaboration amongst uh, various different members. So this is our uh, redeveloped web page, And as you can see, some of the key features over there are data, learn and connect. And uh, we have the uh, update section where you can catch the latest information uh, about what's going on related to AI and healthcare. Uh, you have the sessions, which are live sessions uh, advertised over there. We have a podcast channel. So the latest podcasts are over there and some of the key articles uh, also make it to our front page. We have the connect section where uh, we provide information about our prior events and sessions, which are stored on our uh, YouTube channel, also called BrainX Community YouTube channel. So even if you miss it, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and you will get the latest information about uh, our uh, event that was held recently, and you can still go and watch that one. Uh, as I mentioned, our uh, very active group is on LinkedIn. It's crossed 2,000 members now, and we share a lot of scientific material over there. We sh share information about conferences, about some of the good work done by various different people in the field of AI and healthcare. And then we have the Learn section, which provides a repository of links to some of the articles uh, which are of uh, key interest to people who are in this field. Uh, we curate these articles. We provide the links to these articles directly from our webpage. Uh, of course, some of them uh, are not open source, so you have to go to the journal uh, as needed. And these are categorized for the different healthcare specialties with the filter option. So you can filter them for the specialty that you're interested in and try to locate what's going on uh, in, in that particular healthcare specialty. We added the journal section. So if you're interested in uh, looking at which are some of the key journals uh, in this field, you can filter within the learn section by journal and you can find some of the key journals uh, which are focused on AI and healthcare research and publication. Uh, thereby you can go to the journals directly from here. And then this was a section that we added recently. Uh, of course, there are some uh, really good books uh, to enhance our knowledge and they keep uh, coming up with new editions or there are new books that are coming up. So if you want to read certain books uh, in this field, you can uh, again filter within the learn section by book and you can find some real interesting uh, books to enhance your knowledge. And one of the very popular sections that we have is the data section. All of us are looking for sources of data to build our latest and greatest machine learning or AI model. Uh, this one is the largest uh, repository uh, of open source uh, data sets, and you can filter them because they are categorized by uh, different healthcare specialties. So you can filter and look for the data that you're looking for, and it provides direct link to the data set or to the place which houses the data set. Uh, one of our uh, very popular uh, mediums of knowledge, uh, which was la launched last year, is podcasts, where we bring in conversations with uh, some of the, the uh, experts from around the world, talking about their journeys, talking about their experience in this field, and sharing their vision for the future. So uh, please sign up for our podcast called Rainx Talks, and you can get it on your favorite podcast medium whether it's Apple, whether it is uh, Spotify or uh, Google, uh, you can get it there. So subscribe us and get to hear the latest podcast from people around the world, the experts around the world, sharing a lot of information. 
And then of course, everybody is looking for meetings and conferences. A lot of us are done with the COVID pandemic. So good thing is that a lot of uh, these meetings and conferences are coming back in person in many places. So if you visit our meetings and conferences section, uh, you will find some of the key meetings listed for this year. And you can you can register for those or gain more information about them. And uh, this year, we are starting with a very exciting team evaluating AI models in healthcare. We have some excellent speakers. I'm very excited about this topic because this topic essentially talks to us about our journey. Uh, two, three years ago, when we were holding some of these sessions, we were talking about how do we develop research models? How do we uh, uh, test the accuracy of these research models? But, but now, I think this, as the field matures more and more in healthcare, we are talking about how do we up, how do we evaluate these AI models in healthcare? So that is very exciting. It just shows how we are evolving. We're going to start off with uh, Dr. Joe Zhang. He's the senior fellow in intensive care medicine, Institute of Global Health Innovation, uh, Imperial College of London. He's also the Wellcome Trust Clinical Research Fellow in Health Informatics and Translational AI, which will be followed by Willie uh, McKinnon. And he's the Associate Professor at the University of South Australia. And again, you can reach, read his profile, uh, uh, very uh, extensive background in this field, followed by Sabah Ansari, who is a MRI radiographer and senior lecturer in medical imaging at the School of Medicine, Deakin University. So we have some really exciting speakers. And with that, I'm going to invite Joe Zhang to uh, for his presentation. Cool, thanks very much, Pierce. That's really cool. That's really interesting. Um, and thanks for inviting me as well. Um, just got a very short one. It's a little project that a few colleagues and friends of mine put together. Um, my area of research is in the sort of interface between informatics and AI. Uh, and uh, most of my work is on data infrastructure in the UK and model deployment. Uh, this is a project we put together for uh, some of the things that Piers was alluding to, uh, which is that you know more and more attention now has been paid to concepts like research waste in AI and the lack of translation of research from pages of journal to the bedside. And there's lots of issues there that we don't need to discuss in detail, but uh, there's a lack of maturity in how we evaluate these models in the literature relative to real world circumstances, and also lack of inclusion of research teams in developing societies where AI uh, might have the most impact out of anywhere where you might deploy it. So. Uh, some colleagues and I set out to do a mapping exercise of trying to create a unifying perspective over all of AI research at once. And uh, we've all seen the many systematic reviews in AI, which all tend to tell the same story, which is sort of high risk of bias in models, low potential for clinical translation. Fewer reviews uh, tell us how models might sit in a real world context. And also reviews tend to leave the vast majority of AI work unmapped. Uh, the reason we use systematic reviews or employ a systematic way of reviewing is that the search functions we have in uh, academic literature search engines have a very poor balance of sensitivity and specificity. So let's say you search very broad AI terms, you may get, uh, and actually you do get about 150,000 papers, only a small proportion of which are really relevant to the question you're interested in. So we wanted to uh, develop a way of mapping the entire AI research landscape, answering the questions of, can we identify papers which are directly developing new models for AI? Uh, can we also identify uh, papers which evaluate AI models at a much more mature stage, so a step closer to real world deployment? Can we also map the global distribution of everything which is being produced everywhere? And can we also use this paradigm to track major themes such as uh, the types of data being used, the types of specialties that AI is being developed in uh, across all of these areas of AI research over time. And one of the reasons for this is uh, depending on the data being used, depending on the specialty you're looking at, there's going to be a lot of heterogeneity in how research and models are being developed. Uh, so just quickly, this is a framework that we put together to look at model maturity. Uh, most of the stuff that you might see in systematic reviews looks at risk of bias and quality of reporting, uh, which is all in model building. 
But actually, if you step back and look at a bigger picture, we can see a, a framework for AI development where to bring a model to somewhere that's closer to real world deployment, you first have to compare it to whatever a real world gold standard is. So that's stage three on here, which we call comparative research. So for example, that might be testing an AI model for diagnosing lung cancer against a clinical radiologist. And further to that, uh, to actually bring a device into practice, you need to actually deploy it into a real world setting with real world data streams and assess its performance when hit with all the problems that you might get with data and software and hardware infrastructure, which has been a problem for lots of real world deployments, uh, for example, with Google recently with their retinopathy screening models. So uh, based on that framework, we decided to use natural language processing for mapping this because uh, trying to just look at search terms, et cetera, just didn't have enough sensitivity or specificity. Luckily, uh, so none of us in the team are actually AI scientists, but luckily there's very good off the shelf natural language processing models available. Uh, we use BERT, uh, which is bi-directional encoder representations. It's a type of transformer models which can learn the context for any word in a corpus using words before and after. And you can get BERT models which are pre-trained, uh, including one that's been pre-trained on pretty much everything that's been ever published on PubMed, uh, which is quite cool because any words from that already has a pre-context that's learnt and built into the model. So, uh, here, so this is a maturity model that I was talking about before. Uh, just give you a little moment to look at that. And uh, this is the pipeline that we uh, built. So it scrapes everything it can find off uh, Medline to do with AI under very broad search terms. And it passes through a BERT-based model for inclusion. So trying to include anything which is building a model related to AI in a clinical context. Uh, it then passes those papers to a second model, which we trained to classify model maturity. So that's based on the previous framework. And it looks specifically for papers which conduct comparative research or papers which try, tries to evaluate models in a uh, real world prospective context. And then it gets passed to uh, another multi-classifier based on BERT, which tries to identify uh, specialties, uh, also types of data, types of algorithms and labels, all the abstracts which are scraped for those characteristics. And in parallel to this, uh, we take all of these papers and we uh, extract all the affiliations for the authors and we pass it through some geocoding code, uh, which locates the longitude and latitude of any author affiliations. And all of these then get, get combined into a labeled data set and also feeds into a dashboard, which I'll show you guys later. Um, so you get some quite interesting results and you can do some quite interesting things with the data from this uh, pipeline. So on the left, this is a horizon chart over time uh, for the past decade showing uh, the biggest specialties that have seen AI research being produced. The blue is all research. Uh, the orange is mature research uh, by the definition that we've described. And what you find is that across all of these specialties, there's a huge amount of heterogeneity in how mature research is produced, when mature research is produced. And there may even be a signal there for translation looking into the future. Uh, the right, again, blue being all publications and orange being mature publications, you can see a bit of heterogeneity in where uh, more mature research has been developed and where these authors are uh, across different countries. Of course, China and the United States tend to be the biggest producers, but the imbalance between uh, developed and developing countries is very stark to see here. Um, you can also do things like map how data types are being used across different types of research. So we started producing these heat maps. This is for mature research. And what you can see is across uh, major specialties and subspecialties and disease areas, the type of data, the type of clinical data, whether that's imaging, radiology, uh, signal-based or electronic health record, natural language and processing data, how that's being used across all of these areas. This uh, diagram in specific is for uh, mature research, so stuff that's comparative in the real world, and you can see a predominance of imaging there or computer vision based data types, apart from arrhythmia, uh, where you can see that there's a, a sort of spike in how ECG has been used, but notably very little research with uh, genomics, biomarkers, uh, natural language processing, electronic health records, and that could reflect the difficulty in deploying those types of data in real world uh, pipelines and real world situations. 
so this feeds into a dashboard, uh, which is on ai4health.app. That's live uh, at the moment. And the pipeline's deployed in the back end uh, on Google Cloud. And the dashboard is uh, coded in Dash Plotly and basically takes data from that, which refreshes every 24 hours. And you can uh, use data browsers to browse the distribution. There's heat maps. And you can also see how things are changing over time as well as a global distribution. And one of the features of this dashboard is that you can download the full data sets uh, for all research with all the labels attached to it and use that however you like for as a start for a systematic review or systematic review of areas of mature research or however you like. And that's totally open access. Uh, the code's also available and the uh, GitHub link is on the dashboard. So I guess where to next? Uh, so we published this as a preprint. Uh, we've actually just submitted a, a revision to Lancet Digital Health last week. So fingers crossed, you might see this there. Uh, but we're working on a few uh, additions, uh, version two and three of this. Uh, there's a model that we're using to classify affiliation, uh, also entity recognition for data sets and also recognizing data set size. Uh, the models there, just that graph very quickly uh, shows you a beta version, that model for tracking the size of data sets over time. And we can see how just in the past uh, five, six years has been a big spike in the sort of uh, upper percentiles of how big data sets are, but actually the median data set size being used across most researchers has stayed relatively small. Um, we're also doing some research with Leo Selly's team in uh, America uh, about drivers for maturity translation and also a, re a review of uh, potential AI failures in the mature research. So uh, this dashboard was very much a, a global collaboration with people from all the continents, actually, um, apart from the one at the top and the one at the bottom, um, but uh, mainly with Steve Weeble, who's also based in Australia, uh, who I worked on this very closely with. Um, and yeah, we are very keen to have more people come and work on this or use the data however you like, uh, or contribute to the dashboard with ideas. So please get in touch, uh, happy to connect by email or uh, add me on LinkedIn. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Joe. This is very exciting. Uh, and it's really impressive. You said like nobody on the team has background in in uh, advanced like NLP or, or machine learning. Did, did I hear that right from you? Uh, yeah, so we're uh, with kind of clinician data scientists. None of us are right, right. AI modelers or AI engineers, but I think right. we're lucky to live in a in a century where you can pick you know, state of the art models off the shelf for anything, whether it's computer vision or natural language or, uh, you know, any sort of prediction and need need just very little code to make it work for your use case. Yeah, I, th I think that is very encouraging for a lot of clinicians uh, who, who listen to this uh, and want to, to get involved and engage uh, in the field of AI or ML uh, and try to develop at least prototype some things. Uh, of course, you need the machine learning experts, uh, like the ones who are going to come and talk to us to, to advance it further, but at least we can play with it. At least we can, we can uh, and your team has done an excellent job with this. So thank you very much for, for sharing all the work. And I'm sure there's a lot that is going to come out of this. Now, what was also interesting to me is that some of, some of the key characteristics that you shared on the dashboard they do match up with the year in review that BrainX community produces. So we do a year in review and we put it on, on preprint two. It's a very exhaustive review where we look at a PubMed based search. And based on that, we classify the publications for different specialities. And I was looking through some of the slides and it does look like it matches quite a bit with, uh, with you know, your yeah. findings too over there. Yes. Yes. And I think it's a lot related to the data with that. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, if you don't mind hanging out, I know we are, we are we are like in three different continents, and that's the amazing part about uh, kicking off 2022 in style. Uh, people from three different continents coming together to to uh, present their work and getting us excited. So with that, I'm going to request uh, Willie uh, Mackinnon to uh, do his the, uh, talk. Hey, Piyush. I have a question. Yes. That's a good question. My name is Shoibal. I have a question for Joe. Is this a good time to ask questions? 
Uh, if you don't mind, can we take them at the end, please? So that we can get, uh, okay. once we listen to all the speakers, you could probably take them at the end from everyone okay. together. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Pius, for, for inviting both me and, and Saba uh, to talk about um, the work that we've been doing in terms of of uh, trying to expand the evaluations of, of AI um, models in, in, in healthcare into the direction of translation and, and practice. And um, uh, just a quick word of my background. So um, I started my uh, scientific career um, as, a, as a sort of a computational engineer or, or scientist and then somehow ended up in a, in a research group that studied type one diabetes as it, it, it usually happens. And, and, and uh, we, we did some machine learning early work. This was 15 years ago um, for metabolomics data and, and uh, particularly cardiovascular diseases. And um, I have to say that that that's a domain where, in a way, the kind of the promise of personal medicine, at least from a point of view of risk prediction, hasn't really happened. Uh, there's a lot of AI applications in cardiovascular medicine, but in terms of the kind of initial idea where we had that, okay, if we just measure enough stuff from the blood, we can predict whether someone gets a heart attack in five years or something like that. It, 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 it still doesn't work. Um, uh, so, so I, I sort of took a break from that type of uh, predictive modeling for a while and, and focused more on the perhaps more traditional epidemiological viewpoint where you are interested in risk factors for diseases at the population level. So that's, that's where most of my work has been done. Um, but recently, um, I got an opportunity to join in the um, Australian Alliance for Artificial um, Intelligence in Healthcare. And um, there came an opportunity to, uh, in a way, go back to this AI field. Of course, it has changed so much in the past 15 years and, and, and the sort of uh, perhaps underwhelming experiences I had with, with some of the precision medicine and omics I think it was called personalized medicine at that point. It's now been rebranded as precision medicine. Um, it has really sort of um, changed recently. I've, I've analyzed a little bit different data sets that actually sort of allow precision medicine. Uh, so it sort of restored my faith in, in AI somewhat. And I think what, what Joe showed just now is, is going to be the, the future type of applications of this sort of mining of of enormous um, kind of complex format databases, rather than perhaps the sort of idea that you, you measure a panel of biomarkers in the blood and then you can predict someone's life course, which uh, nobody can predict the future. But for this particular work, um, we were interested in, in, in a way, kind of finding a set of criteria that we could apply to upcoming AI uh, applications or AI solutions at different phases of development. Uh, and the idea was particularly to expand it from the usual, very technical uh, evaluation criteria or the sort of reporting guidelines that journals like to put out and move it into a, a really assessing that, is this an area where we need an AI to solve it? Um, what sort of an AI would do it? Are there any ethical problems associated with it? Is it actually in the end useful for the patients? Does it save money, et cetera, et cetera. And, and uh, Sandeep has been a, a really instrumental part in, in driving uh, this framework. And I also like to mention uh, Professor Wendy Rogers from Macquarie University. So she has really opened at least my eyes, because I'm more sort of a technical person. So she has opened my eyes about ethics and, um, and, and privacy and, and how, how there's, there's more to these AI models than just meeting your performance requirements. Um, 
I also listed here Saba and Aaron and others who have done a lot of the, the, the initial review work we did for, for some of the results I'm going to show you. Um, and then we actually had Piyush involved in this as well. So, so I'm, I'm very happy that we had a very, very diverse group of people participating in this project. So how, how, could, we, how could we assess the quality of, of proposed AI applications? Uh, at a sort of an initial idea stage where you might have a big data set and, and, and you just sort of, okay, let's, let's find a research question or a prediction target that we're going to use that data to the next stage of perhaps, can we turn this into a usable device or usable product or usable application? And then at the later stage, is this actually going to produce use for the kind of people in the trenches, the clinicians and the patients who are, who are operating in hospitals and of course, all their support structures. And obviously an AI that responds in binary code is pretty useless. So I think there's a quite a lot of ground to cover here. And, and I feel that I've only scratched the surface so far. Um, we are happy to report that we, we, we published the first version of the, of the Valium framework in, in BMG Health and Care Informatics. I added the, the page here just to show you the link. So um, you can go and, and, and read this uh, paper for details. And it has a supplement that actually lists the specific criteria we used. At the same time, I do have to say that this is still a, a sort of a living document. So we are, we are constantly refining the documentation, et cetera. Um, so so uh, further developments are probably coming. So what is this TEHI, translational evaluation of healthcare artificial intelligence? Well, we have defined three sort of core components. Uh, the first is capacity, which is, this is kind of really more my area, which deals with the, with the actual performance and, and accuracy and reliability of the model from a statistical point of view, and, and, and whether it's sort of, whether the technical design fits purpose. Uh, but then, uh, moving on to the sort of next level, we, we have considered also utility. And this is really important because it includes uh, important subcomponents such as safety and quality control. Transparency is very important, privacy, and of course, harm. As, as Wendy often reminded, most biomedical studies don't really consider harm well enough. So I think there is an, there's an uh, sort of an area of, of opportunity to, to fix. And then the last part, which is perhaps the least familiar to me personally, is the actual adoption, because I don't have the practical experience of being uh, of, of having delivered actual applications in the, in the clinical practice. I've always been the more sort of a basic science side of things. And, and it's a whole host of, of other questions, like I mentioned, sort of uh, how, do you, how do you integrate these, these new AIs into workflows? Um, have, have people who propose the AI products or applications, have they already uh, sort of deployed them into multiple services so that we actually have experience of how they work in the real world, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a, there's a lot of really important um, questions that need to be asked uh, at, at, at that side of things. And just to show you a little bit of results that we have had so far in actually applying this uh, framework, um, we did a very, very focused um, study where we, where we looked at COVID-19 AI papers. That's an obvious um, a sort of a topical um, niche. And, and we had nine reviewers go through uh, altogether 103 papers. And this rather complicated picture shows um, what the output of the framework looks like. Um, we, have, we have divided, like I said, we had three main components and then each, three, each of the core components had then a variable number of subcomponents. And we graded each component for each study 
using a, a four tier system. So if, if you get a zero, you fail to meet basic requirements. So for example, if, if, you, um, if you didn't report anything about the data set you used, you would get low points. Um, studies that we thought were, were low quality received one point um, and studies that had more or less than acceptable um, work in, in certain areas gave two points. And then very few studies that had really pushed the envelope and, 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 and really done a good job uh, got three points. And uh, what I like to highlight from this picture is that you see that in this very focused COVID-19 AI paper sample, most studies scored two points for many of these questions. Um, I like to highlight a couple that scored really low. And the first one is in the capability, capacity core component, um, what we uh, defined as external validation. And I, I mean a very strict definition of external validation in the sense that you build a model in one hospital data and then apply that to another hospital data, for example. That would be an example of a, of a true external validation. And, and very few studies actually done that. Now, me coming from this epidemiology background and genetics background, um, we don't really take studies that haven't been replicated in independent cohorts seriously anymore, it's particularly in, in population genetics. So, so to me, uh, this is one of the, the key messages I want to, to give people that, that when you actually right in the very beginning when you start planning to do an AI application, already plan in how are you going to validate it externally in terms of this technical quality. It's then another thing when you, when you try to deploy it somewhere. Um, another feature that I wanna highlight is uh, the low scores that most studies had for safety and harm. So these were not really mentioned. I mean, a, a large proportion of the studies were quite technical. And, and I remember when I went through university, nobody, nobody told me about how AI predictions can actually cause harm or that there might be privacy and security issues with uh, systems with data flows. It, it wasn't really, it, 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 it's all about fitting the best possible models to your data. That was, that was really the focus in the kind of engineering training at that point. So to me, that has been quite a, quite a sort of a insightful journey to, to realize that, ah, there's, there's so much more than just the, the technical details that are necessary for successful AI development. And with that, I'd like to hand over the torch to, to Saba, um, who will give her um, impressions on this same, same uh, effort. Thanks. How about we might be on mute? Yeah. Oh, Welcome. thank you. So, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Willow, for the intro. Guys, I won't um, take too much time. I have three slides and I want to just drill home three things uh, about our experience of using Tihai Framework. So, what was it like for the uh, team to actually take this framework and apply it to the literature that we reviewed? Our observations after reviewing it, uh, reviewing the literature using the framework. So uh, many overlaps there uh, with what Vele has mentioned, but I'll just uh, run over the key uh, things that we drove away with and what we think is necessary for translatability. The themes are pretty much what Vele has mentioned. And so I have Joe, I think we all recognize that we now need to take AI um, with this technical capability into where it can actually have an impact for our patients. Um, okay. Uh, so our experience, we found it fairly simple, but looking at um, 
like some like for example the dashboard Joe presented I think that stage would have been really helpful the tricky part for us was to pull out the relevant papers there were so much um, that wasn't useful and uh, so it took us a long time just to get the papers that we felt were relevant that we wanted to review but once we got to that stage the process was fairly simple there was a slight learning curve with familiarizing ourselves with COVID literature uh, just to get like domain expertise but once we got the hang of the kind of papers we were looking at it took us less than five minutes to review a paper using the T-Hive uh, framework and, and pretty much all reviews felt this way. A key thing was that we had a multidisciplinary team and I think this was really useful and became really apparent when we had our team meetings regularly discussing results. So we had uh, data scientists, uh, we had uh, computer scientists, we had hospital administrators, clinicians, um, as well as lab uh, based scientists and we could it was really clear how everyone interpreted uh, different domains within the framework slightly differently and applied the framework slightly differently so for those end users who want to make a decision about an AI product and its deployment um, or usability within their own setting I think a team approach would still be a good way to go when looking at the product uh, so an example being a computer scientist might have looked at whether the algorithm is in public domain or whether the algorithm is actually published or uh, reviewed external validity, slightly different to how a clinician might have uh, reviewed, uh, viewed that. So they might have been a little bit more strict in how they saw what meant it to be externally validated, the product. And as Willie mentioned, when... Uh, uh, this will be a living document. And uh, so the key focus was not actually to review the uh, COVID literature, it was our test case. We wanted to see how well the framework works when you are applying it to assess an AI product. And we, we used COVID literature as a test bed. And when applying the framework, we realized that certain domains could be clarified in their wording. Um, so as the discipline evolves, uh, the framework will also need to evolve and have a few iterations. And that's how we um, would like to pursue with the stages two and three of this project. Uh, so our observations. Um, so we saw some excellent papers and we learned that sound methodology and rigor and analysis is great. It makes for a great paper, but really there wasn't a link between that and translatability. So a great product didn't necessarily translate into clinical outcomes for the patient or for the clinician. And uh, many of the focus papers focused on this developing an algorithm and then comparing it with others and maybe beating them by a few points. And um, uh, there are very clever people out there in computer science area, and perhaps this is not the best use of our time. Um, so once a model works, uh, the focus then needs to sort of shift towards how do we uh, how do we test its function in the real world, whether it's robust enough to handle some of the things that um, um, Joe has mentioned that you know um, algorithms need to be able to deal with uh, when they are in use and uh, and and often fail <laughs> uh, at that point. And uh, prospective clinical uh, trials are scarce, but really essential to have clinical impact. Uh, this is really uh, not something that is even thought of um, twice in a clinical research domain, but too many AI papers focus on the product and, and there is no consideration or, min or sort of not, not even a mention, let alone trying to dissect this problem of how do we make sure that it's safe and that we are monitoring that is safe and how do we deal when it sort of doesn't work and a person walks away with that diagnosis, for example. Bear in mind, we did look at COVID only papers, but in my own research, uh, focusing on prostate cancer detection and AI is much the same story. So I don't think it would be too big a leap of faith to say that this is a broader problem that we sort of need to move towards addressing now. We've done the really cool work of um, making uh, AI work, but then how to take it to the next step and see that if it's useful in a clinical setting. So with translatability, we think it's essential that uh, computer scientists work with clinical scientists. 
uh, so that the solution is well-rounded enough to have a clinical impact and that AI can be informed. Uh, more consideration, as Rile mentioned, needs to be given to risk assessment and avoidance of harm. And uh, this last bit is really key. External validation needs to be part of basic AI experimental design process. So at university level, wherever um, the computer scientists are trained, I don't think that this should be an optional extra. This really needs to be part of the very basic experimental design process. Uh, so how the model performs when subjected to unseen new data rather than data from the same center. So I'll finish with that. Um, you can uh, connect if you have any questions via email or LinkedIn or, or Twitter. I'll hand back to you, Piyush. It's still on mute, Piyush. Yeah, this, this time it was me who was on mute. So yeah, that was very exciting. And, and uh, I think uh, all the work that you showcased, you know, sets, a, sets us up for 2022 to exploit you know, some of the research that you have already done, some of the platforms you have already built. And I, I just want to take a moment to showcase some of those stuff. It just got me excited that we have been working on some of this too uh, for a little bit. Just give me one moment, I'll share my screen. And uh, can you see my screen with the, with the paper or is it my desktop? It's your desktop. Okay, so that's not the right one. Just give me one moment here. But we have been publishing uh, for Britannix commun community uh, every year uh, for the last three years, uh, year in review. And the idea started with, you know, same idea as uh, you all have had that uh, how can we curate uh, this data and this information and uh, present it in a way where it's usable to a lot of other people. So this is an example of last year's review. You might find some of the, the, uh, the names over here who are here on the, uh, uh, at this meeting. But uh, what we found is not different. So that's what I wanted to share that based on our methodology and you can, I'll put the link to this one uh, uh, in the chat and it's available on BrainX community in the learn section of our webpage. But we ended up like excluding a lot of publications year over year because they, with a the permit, so they weren't like worthwhile for various different reasons. Either the search was wrong or uh, resulted wrong uh, results or they were not good enough. And when you see year over year, we have classified them for different specialities. So this is done manually. And of course it goes to a second level where we have specialist editor, editors uh, for this who look through these two. And what you find is that a lot of uh, publications are coming through and they're growing exponentially uh, year over year. But then we found something similar going through this, that yes, as they're scaling up, the majority of these, these uh, publications, all the growing, uh, they are growing in different ways. So imaging, definitely the leader in here, something similar to uh, what Joe had found. Uh, probably because of the kind of data that they have, the kind of algorithms that exist that you can apply. Uh, and then oncology, again, because of the data uh, that they have. So those have been some of the, the front runners. And uh, I will keep this for next month, but we are finishing up our 2021 review. And I'll leave you guessing so as to which specialities are the front runners for 2021. And I'll tell you, there are some really, really interesting trends that you will find when we release this uh, uh, this next month. Uh, so again, share uh, some of the similar findings uh, as shared by Joe, Willie, uh, and Saba. Uh, but I think also sets us up for what is needed uh, this year uh, moving forward and how do we get to more advanced stages. Uh, I'm going to, I'll have Sable ask his question. I know he had put it in the chat, but uh, he had raised his arm. So Sable, uh, if you want to ask your question to our speakers. Yeah, sorry. Uh, hi, my name is Shoival Banerjee. I wanted to ask Joe this question in his studies. Um, how much data was 
unstructured data, which is basically the NLP data and the computer vision data, which I presume comes in unstructured form. I do not know if you do feature extraction or make it go through a deep learning procedure whereby feature extraction is gone. But I wanted to know whether you guys found how much of the data you needed was structured, how much of the data you did was unstructured. Was there a separation? Do you mean the data that we're predicting on? Yes. Yeah, so it's entirely unstructured abstracts. Sorry if I didn't make that clear. So the, okay. uh, the transformer model works by firstly vectorizing each word according to a pre-learned context. Yeah, I, I got it. I and got yeah, it. and then it just feeds into a TensorFlow Keras. Uh, I see. So did you try stuff. any vision data other than NLP data? Did you do any? No, so everything's, uh, most of the labeling and the model sort of type prediction all happens on the abstracts. The only structured bit we use is the affiliation data, which just okay. goes through some geolocating code. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right, great question. And uh, and I think it's important to understand some of these technical uh, aspects of these two because they end up helping us in understanding the output that we are getting, right? Uh, so I actually have a question for, for Willis about or Joe. So where do we go from here? So we have uh, honored that, yes, there are certain gaps and it lays the foundation for us to to move forward, but I wanted to get your thoughts on where do we go from here? Well, I, I, can, I can sort of start from this. It's, it's, it's a very sort of a personal perspective from, from me uh, because I, uh, so, so what I've observed is that um, often the sort of machine learning uh, people or applications, um, they might not necessarily be aware of how to design studies. So I'm still at the, at the sort of a, if you, if you think about the, 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 the progression from different phases of developing an, a working AI for, for healthcare. So in the beginning, um, I, th I think sort of machine learning expert uh, could use more awareness of the sort of basic principles from epidemiological research of how do you design studies. So that would be a sort of a, at that point, sort of technical one. Um, on the next stages also, um, uh, I, I think the sort of the, the ethics and privacy issues that were usually quite well done in clinically oriented papers but not well done in more machine learning engineering related papers. So I think there's also an opportunity to just create awareness that even though you get your data from a public repository, you should still at least have an ethics statement in your paper, just even that level of awareness. Um, so I, I think that that could be one way of, of going forward. Uh, Sabai, you, you had quite a few uh, lessons that you learned from this. So any thoughts from you? What would be some of the next steps for us? Uh, yeah, two, two main thoughts from my own PhD research, it being AI-based, like AI application into imaging. I feel like not having any computer science background is a real challenge. And I think probably all clinicians who want to work in this space feel that way unless it's been a natural sort of a background hobby for you. So I think coding or some level of basic programming needs to now be part of curriculum for um, doctors and healthcare workers. So because there are so many applications and so much leveraging we can do with just some basic uh, computer science knowledge, because as uh, Joe mentioned, there are so many off the shelf products you can use with just some basic knowledge, but even that is not touched on in most health curriculums. So just slight, you know, as well as training the computer science in a bit of a scientist, in a bit of experimental design, also training the healthcare workers a little bit with some computer science knowledge would be fantastic. And the second thing um, that Ville mentioned, just building on that about ethics and consent. 
So as a patient, I never really have an opportunity to consent. So I think a large number of patients will be okay. Uh, not everybody, but a, a substantial population would be okay with their data being used uh, to generate new products and AI applications if it was properly secured and de-identified. But that is not part of uh, when you sort of sign into the hospital system or even radi at radiology, that is not part of the routine process. And I think we could really solve many of our ethics uh, consent related issues if we uh, sort of address this at the administration level. Um, so yeah, just the two things there. Yeah, some, some great thoughts over there. I think a lot of groups that are working on this. Uh, Joe, thoughts from you? Um, so, we, uh, with a few colleagues, we're, we're working on a sort of framework for AI deployment, which looks at vertical integration. And I think if you if you draw parallels from industry, uh, so non-healthcare industries, which have been using AI for years, if not a decade longer than healthcare, their paradigm has always been very business focused, right? So AI is used to generate value. It's not done for the sake of AI. Whereas AI in healthcare is very much and has been for the past decade an academic exercise. You have we have lots of static data sets. We have static data sets mostly from research cohorts. And pioneers like Leo at MIT building mimic ICU data sets. And these data sets exist. And where data sets exist, it's nice to do something exciting with them, right? So it's almost turned into a rite of passage in a lot of places where you have a data set. Let's think of a question you can answer with this data set. Let's predict something. And the excitement is, uh, as Sabas says, in, in the algorithm building, in iterating, in, in getting state of the art with a change in algorithmic architecture. And I think the difference between industry and healthcare is in healthcare, we need to move away from the paradigm of uh, model building as the central pillar of how we develop AI. And by model building, I actually include uh, training on external data sets because those data sets are still static. It doesn't matter if it's in a different institution. The barrier to deployment isn't necessarily generalizability, but it's how that data is going to feed into the model. And one of the big reasons why radiology has gone ahead so much is because radiology everywhere uses DICOM and it uses DICOM in very well structured uh, imaging access pathways and software pipelines, where it's very easy to harmonize those imaging files and feed them into a model that's deployed somewhere. But that is not the same at all for, let's say your model's trying to use a bit of genomics, a bit of patient demographic data, a bit of patient physiology. You're immediately talking about four or five different clinical software systems that are entirely different between different hospitals. So getting that model into practice and trying to set up those data streams is you know, near impossible if you've got a model that's trained on, let's say, static research data sets, no matter how many places those data sets come from. So the places which are really pushing forward with deployable AI, like the Mayo Clinic, and in from the UK perspective, uh, some work being done at King's and Leeds, the approach is very much a sort of vertically integrated, but also data first approach where you set up your data environment, you look at what data is available and how you get that data uh, from software into the model. You set that up first and as well as data scientists and clinicians, what industry found five to 10 years ago is that you need engineers, you need uh, software, hardware engineers, you know, people to actually build the pipelines uh, to get that data instead of just training the algorithms and clin clinicians who understand the context. So I think uh, it's happening um, and it needs, I think, an organizational rethink of you know, how we approach this. And as you guys said, the regulation side at the moment is a total mess uh, from you know, an FDA or a European CE perspective of how we're supposed to regulate and ensure safety of these devices. Yeah, I think it, uh, it essentially comes to my down to developing a large scale strategy because we have been very research focused. I think it requires a completely different strategy to get it into translation aspects and, and implementation aspects. Uh, and uh, well, I do see Dr. Sandeep Reddy over here too, who was the, the first author on the TI paper. He, he's here. I just want to see if he can give us a last word on this. I don't know if I can add more to what Willie and uh, Sabah and Joe have mentioned, but one thing is for certain is that there is a, it's not a, problem. a long gap 
uh, big gap between what uh, is being um, portrayed as happening with AI in healthcare and in reality. If you look at the number of uh, clinical guidelines that are issued, there's thousands, but none of them mention anything about AI as being a standard protocol. So I think there is a lot of work. Um, the path spins today by the general AI community to help bridge that uh, translational gap. And I think the THI was primarily kind of um, um, constructed and developed, keeping that in mind. That's great. No, thank you very much. And I think uh, with, with, with that, uh, we hope that the platform that we have created, the Brinex community platform, fosters this collaboration, uh, is able to provide you with the latest curated information. Uh, and please join us. Uh, please join us for the live sessions. Uh, please utilize the freely available information through this. And uh, hopefully we are able to develop uh, more mature models in the future. So thank you everyone. Thank you to the speakers for an awesome presentation. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Take care.